Welcome back to another edition of Yes, We Are Here. I'm Jack Curry, and today I'm joined by a major league player who had one of the most majestic swings you will ever see in Daryl Strawberry. And also, by the way, one of the nicest guys you would ever meet. And Daryl, I have to start out by asking, I know you're in the St. Louis area. How are you and your family doing during this difficult time? We're doing well. We're doing well during this difficult time because we're not affected as much as uh, other places are, uh, like New York City and California, uh, the places that had completely shut down. But we, we had shutdowns in so many ways, but at the same time, uh, it's been pretty flexible here. We've been able to go out to, to the parks and have walks when it's not raining, when it's not cold. Uh, we've had a lot of rain lately, but um, it's just me and my wife, Tracy, at home, and, and we're doing well with our puppies. And it, it, it's, it's a very challenging time for all of us, but at the same time, you know, you have to uh, stay positive and stay upbeat about life because we don't never know what it's going to bring us. I'm glad you mentioned that challenging time because, Daryl, these days you're a Christian minister and, and you are preaching to people. And during this, you've had a pretty powerful message because you've got firsthand experience with drug and alcohol abuse. And you've put out the message there of you might be home, you might be in the middle of a pandemic, but don't reach into areas that might get you into trouble. Well, yeah, just just don't get lost. You know, I, I think that's the key for most people. Um, most people have never experienced frustration and challenging times like we are now. And it's not just one person. It's an it's a entire society who has to go through it. And you think about the unemployment of what's happened to people, and so many people can turn to so many wrong things. You know, when you're broken and when you're hurting, you usually turn to the wrong things. And, and I've seen that um, through myself, my own experience myself, and also through the younger generation who has got addicted to opiates and heroin, and they've all been dying. We've had an epidemic for a very long time. Uh, with our young generation uh, because our young people believe they're not important and don't understand the reality of life. So um, now we all are sitting through the coronavirus and we're all sitting here and wondering what's next, you know, <laughs> what is next? You know, we don't know what's next. I, I just know that people need to be patient and they need to really find some, some type of faith for themselves, you know, because this is probably the be beginning of so many different things that's going to take place in our society. And I think a lot of people are not prepared. And when we're not prepared, you know, things, things happen like this, like the coronavirus, just like 9-11, when that happened, you know, we were a country that needed to rally together. And through this process here, we all need to rally together. We all need to come together with the government and the president. And we need to get on one board, you know, we need not to be pulling against each other because we're all in this together and everybody's suffering right now. Daryl, you did a book a few years ago, and I love the title of this book. It was called Don't Give Up On Me. And you wrote very graphically and in a lot of details about all of your struggles. How blessed do you feel that you are in the position you're in now where you get the opportunity to talk about your life experiences and help other people? Well, I feel very blessed, you know, to be able to encourage people. I think that's what it really boils down to. And that's what the book was about, to be able to encourage people who are struggling and any areas of life, because we all have some type of areas of life that we're gonna go through some struggles, and how do we get through it? How do we walk through it? How do we fight through it? And usually what happens is we let other people help us. As you know, I, I wrote the book, but you see the different people that were in the book. Ron Doc, who was someone in my life, mm -hmm. you know, when I was struggling, he worked for the Yankees, the boss brought him on, and he worked over there for the Yankees and helped with substance abuse, and he was a big part of, encouraging me and walking with me because you need people to walk with you no matter what anybody has to say you know i think a lot of times people say well you shouldn't be so weak there's nothing weak about you know what happens you know to a person that get get addicted and no one signs up to be addicted to alcohol and drugs you know it's, it's something that has affected them in their life that they've never dealt with that use alcohol and drugs to cover up who we really are and that's what happens to so many, so many people today, you know, in their life. They're doing the same thing that I was doing back in all those years and never get to a place allowing themselves to get the help and let people help you. Because at the end of the day, God is never going to change what he does. He's always going to use people to help people. And that's, you know, that's the criteria of, of life today is people helping people. 
Daryl, you were in the national spotlight from the time you were a teenager. And I know that you got to the levels in baseball with all of that talent. When you reflect on all that attention, how did that help you positively? How did that impact you negatively? Well, the positive side of it was it helped me become the player that I became. Because playing in New York, it's either you're going to play or they're going to let you know. And, and that's just the way it is. And I love that about New York fans. It's, it's a great thing about being able to play in New York and have to walk down that road and have that kind of experience, you know, where you, you need to play because you're talented. This is what they're saying to you. And, and you're more talented than most people, so you need to play at a better level and a higher level. So that's a very positive side. I think the negative side of it is when you come to a place and you feel alone inside. You feel like you're, you're, you're not connected, you know, and you want to be more connected from a life standpoint. And why I say that, Jack, is because I always reflect back to, you know, Gary Carter. Gary Carter was, you know, his life was an example of being a superstar but being a man at the same time. I think that's so big and different than anything I've ever seen in my life when I experienced that and watching him. Uh, as a young player growing up and watching the way he was and the, the joy and the happiness and how great and how kind he was to everybody. And, you know, he, he never had a bad word to say about it, anybody. You know, I think a lot of people don't understand that. So I, I, I realized that part uh, was missing in me. And also, you know, that's the same part I saw in Derek Jeter. Derek, Derek Jeter was the same way. He was a very talented player, very kind loving, never said a bad thing about anybody. People would say things and take shots at him, but he would never make a comment. And, and I wasn't that guy. When somebody said something about me, I went off the top, you know, so I was, there was obviously something that was really missing on the inside of me more than what I was from a talented standpoint. I'm glad you brought up Carter. And in terms of the 86 Mets, you, you look back at that team and, and Carter was sort of on the side, right? Because you would call him the altar boy on that team. Whereas that was a rambunctious, rebellious, tough team with a lot of swagger. When, when you look back on the 86 Mets, even as I'm starting to ask the question, I see you got a little smile on your face. How much fun was that? But also, Daryl, how much did that team potentially leave on the table that, that maybe it could have done more in succeeding years? It, it was an incredible team. I mean, it was an incredible run, you know, once, once Carter came over. First, once Hernandez came over. That was the beginning – of the change for us, you know, is getting Keith. I don't think a lot of people talk about that enough and, and, and credit uh, Frank Cashin, who was the general manager that was making the changes, you know, for the organization. And then we got Keith to come over and, and in that year of 83. I don't know if he wanted to stay or not. Then he said he heard through his father they had some really pretty good prospects in the minor leagues, like, you know, Gooden and all these different guys that would be coming up. So when it, then Doc came up in 84 and then Carter came over and, and then 86, we come to a place where uh, we put all the pieces together. What happened, we was coming up short um, in 84 and 85 uh, against the Cubs and against the Cardinals, which we hated was the Cardinals. We, and the Cubs beat us in 84 because of Rick Sutcliffe, and that's the only reason that was. We still had a great year. But Carter comes over, and Carter makes a difference in who we are. You know, he gives us that right-hand solid bat in the lineup, and he's a catcher, and he can handle the pitching staff. So it brings a different meaning to us when we come to spring training in 1986. And our first meeting was Davey was like, we're going to win it all. And we kind of just, just like looked around and thought to ourselves, yes, we're going to win it all this year. And, and we actually started off the season that way, like gangbusters, you know, in, insane, you know, crazy team. Uh, we fight, we do whatever it takes. But Carter was such a different Carter, Mookie Wilson, probably was two different guys that would, always sit in the front of the bus or be in front of the plane and they were quiet and they were different and they were drinking milk while everybody else was in the back. <laughs> and while everybody else was in the back and we were just having our way with drinking and, and, and being crazy. So, but at the same time, we played together and we stayed together. And that's what I love about that group of guys. And, you know, we were on one accord together of winning. And I think that was the most important thing. And of course, Jack, we, we probably left uh, a, a lot more on the table um, than we should have, you know, uh, we should have had more success in the, the next year, but we lost our whole pitching staff. Nobody really talked about that. Our 87, our pitching staff went down because you can't go, you can't go anywhere if you don't have a pitching staff. I don't care how many bats you have in the lineup, but we had a great pitching staff, 86, and then it got hurt in 87. 
Then 88, I think 88 team was better. And we just, we gagged it. I mean, we gagged, we gagged it against the Dodgers. There's no question about it. We lost that series. We shouldn't have never lost that series to the Dodgers. We've been killing them all year. And we go into the playoffs and we lose that series. Sosha hits that home run off the of dock. I don't know how high Shelby to go on to, and he ends up getting a walk. And then Sosha comes up and hit a, hit a home run to tie the ball game up. And we go on to lose that series in, in game seven, which I thought, which I thought Sid Fernandez should have been pitching game seven. There was so much that happened in 88. David Cohn wasn't with you guys in 86. You get him in 87. He has told me that, that 88 was the year. As you just said, should have won that series. And, and he takes some of the blame because he had the, uh, the early start where he had talked to a Daily News writer, Bob Clappish, and that got the Dodgers fired up. But Coney thinks if the Mets win in 88, that would have been the springboard. Now you've got 86. You've got 88. You're feeling as if you're impenetrable. And history may have been written a lot differently for 89, 90, and the years after that. No question. That, would, that definitely would have been the springboard. And it wasn't Coney's fault. You know, Coney was a, Coney was a complete gamer. Uh, no matter what he, you know, did the article, write the article. That, that, if that had to fire the Dodgers up to beat us, then so be it. But uh, we, should have, we should have won that series. There were things that we should have done different in that series, especially going into game seven. You know, not to take anything personal away from Darling, but I just thought – uh, Sid should have been starting that game, no question about in that game, because Sid was a different type of pitcher, and Sid was a pitcher that did, didn't have to think so much. You know, he hadn't had to worry about pressure being on him. He just Sid, – Sid was the kind of guy just – he just goes out there and pitch, you know, and Coney was phenomenal in that series. You know, he had one rough game, but, you know, that, that's part of part of life. And But he was – oh, Coney was always a big game pitcher for us, and, you know, that's, that shouldn't have been a reason for us not winning that series. We should have won that series. I don't want to speak for David, but I know in, in writing a book with him last year, Full Count, he loved you as a teammate, loved hanging out with you. And one of the things he spoke about was, he said, let's look at Darryl's career. 17 years, 335 homers, four World Series rings, four top 10 finishes in the MVP. While battling substance abuse problems, while conquering colon cancer, and Coney said, a lot of people want to say, Darryl should have been a Hall of Famer. One percent of the players that ever play in Major League Baseball make it to the Hall of Fame. Cohen's point was, can we celebrate the career that he had? How do you react when you hear people saying, wow, Daryl Daryl should have had a plaque in Cooperstown, but it didn't work out that way? Well, I, I, I don't really think about that because I think, I think about the fact that I, I'm grateful that my life turned out the way it did. I'm grateful for the struggle um, because it allowed me to get well more than anything. Because uh, uh, greatness, is, greatness is good to be recognize, you know, from what you did, and, you know, and they talk about you in the Hall of Fame. But at the same time, uh, every player dream is to get to the major leagues one day and be successful. And I just felt like I was very successful. I felt like I had some very special relationships and close friendships. Uh, me and Eric Davis and Chris Brown growing up together, and, and our dream was to play in the big leagues. And, and we got a chance to play in the big leagues coming from South Central L.A. And then having the teammates that I had, like, the, like I said, the 86 match, you know, the – Animal House team. I I I just love that team. I, I just it was a team that just you thrived coming to the ballpark every day. I think the media even thrived coming to the ballpark to see what we had to say because they knew we had something to say because it was a, a lot of chirping going on in the club clubhouse and it it was just fun. It was fun what baseball was like. And then Coney was one. Coney comes over and Coney becomes one of my best friends and he becomes one of the guys. He becomes one of the guys part of the scum bunch. And we just had a great time together. Uh, playing baseball and achieving great things, regardless of, you know, the, the failures of life are real. And I think about all the guys in the Hall of Fame. You know, you think about those that have walked in there, how many that you can really count on your finger that really lived a clean life, you know, didn't have some kind of, some kind of issue, some kind of problem. It, it, it's a lot of men there that has a lot of problems, a lot of question marks yeah. on the guys too. And, you know, they still question, some of the other guys are questioning the guys that did steroid, but you did something too, you know, that, and, and that's, you know, that's not, un, that's so unfair for guys to be able to, you know, point fingers at people because we know that life is so hard and so difficult and so challenging, but at the same time, um, developing real friendships throughout the game was really important to me. And those guys I played with in the eighties and the nineties, those Yankee teams I played with in the nineties, I, I developed some great friendships with a lot of players 
and, and just like in the 80s. So I can say that I'm truly blessed to be able to play in New York City and play with these guys and have, have the relationship that I have. Darrell, 1995, you complete a drug suspension and George Steinbrenner signed you to the Yankees. He received a lot of criticism for that, but he believed in you, believed in giving you another opportunity. When you're, when you're going through your, your life's experiences in your head, how high on the list is George Steinbrenner for, for giving you that, that chance? George is number one on my list because let me tell you, Jack, I'm better today because of him believing in me. Regardless of what anybody want to say, and, and they can say, yeah, you had other people in your life. But he was the only person, you know, that talked to me about the fact of life and, and really having troubles and everybody goes through it. I mean, I said in his office, he's like, everybody has problems. Everybody has troubles. He goes, look at me. They suspended me from baseball. You know, I was a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with me and him, you know, talking about real life and stuff like that. And a lot of times people didn't know that. He didn't just sign me. He actually... He actually cared about me. He cared about my struggles and knew they were real and understood them, I think. And I think a lot of times people didn't give him enough credit, you know, for understanding people's battles and struggles. And, and then for him to bring me over to the Yankees and allow me to, you know, be a part of, of the Yankee organization was just, a, just an incredible time that I will never forget. You know, I had to be accepted, you know, coming over. I wasn't accepted so much in 95 with Buck Walter and all those guys, but I, I, I was accepted because of Donnie. You know, that's the reason why I was accepted in 95 when I came over. And then when I came back, you know, in, in 96, you know, with the team again, you know, that, that process with Joe Torrey and them, they, you know, they brought me in and, and Joe accepted me, you know, he accepted me regardless of all of all the things that people were saying and doubting. I saw his trust in me as a player and, and, and watching me grow as a player over there for them. And, and becoming the guy that I became over there for those Yankee years. You, you contributed in 1996 to a World Series team. They, you end up hitting 11 home runs. But the 98 year really stood out for me. You hit 24 home runs in 1998. You're 36 years old at that point. You have an OPS for the season of almost 900. You were a menace to, to opposing pitchers. It, it was the old Daryl coming back. What do you remember about how things were going so well for you in 98? I remember 98 was just like a fun year because 97, you know, I hurt my knee and, and still was recovering from 98 going into 98. And I just felt strong. I felt strong mentally, I think, more than anything. And I felt like I had a, a role to play with the ball club. And, and learning to accept your role was so important, you know, coming from being a star, you know, in the 80s and now you're playing on a team with a bunch of young stars. And I was able to accept that and able to accept, you know, fitting in wherever I, I could fit in. And, and I just remember Joe always coming to me and saying, how do you feel today? And I was like, I feel great. I said, but you can play one of the other guys if you want to. He goes, no, I'm playing you. That's why I'm asking you how you feel it. So, you know, it was so, it was so good to be able to play under a manager like that, that, that saw something in you. And I just kept being consistent that year. But at the same time, I knew I wasn't well that year. I knew um, – playing I was playing from a physical standpoint but from a health standpoint you know I had blood in my stool just about that whole summer and and going into the last part of the year and didn't realize you know that I would end up sick but I, I knew something was wrong and I was having stomach cramps every day but I knew I was a ball player so you don't go to the doctor if it's not broken you don't go to the doctor you just you just work through it and I kind of worked through it and I was drinking Maalox every day when I was having stomach cramps and and I was losing weight and I was getting fatigued and I was just said, I was saying to myself, something's wrong. But at the end of the year, September, I'll go into the training and tell them I need to probably get checked to start. And I went into the trainers, um, to, yeah, yeah, I went into the trainers and told them, you know, I was having problems, you know, as uh, far as my stool. And they said, well, we need to get you checked in September at the end of the year before the playoffs start. And little did I know when I went in for them from, from that year, there it was, I ended up with colon cancer. And, Daryl, I was in Texas when the Yankees announced that to the players. They were getting ready for the postseason. And I have never seen a more somber clubhouse and then a more somber postseason workout. You've been involved in those workouts. They're fun. You've made it to the postseason. You're excited. The energy is high. And instead, you, you had people like David Cohn had tears in his eyes because your, your teammates were so worried about you. They ended up stitching a 39 onto their caps that October, and they wanted to win because they wanted to win, but I'm confident they wanted to win for you as well. 
Well, I mean, that was pretty amazing. Those guys were awesome. You know, that team was so, so much fun. You know, it was, the, the thing I like about that team was it was no animosity. It was no jealousy. It was just, you know, we, we come today and we play today and we win. You know, and it was just like the 96 team, you know, uh, the same way. You know, we had the same kind of uh, swag about ourselves. You know, we just come and we all play. It doesn't matter who get it done. Let's just get it done. And that's what the 98 team was about. It was so special. It was so special uh, to really see that later. I, I couldn't really see that at the moment in the time because I was on my way into the hospital and I was laying there in the hospital and, and you know, I was kind of, I was so worried. And, and then w one day, I, you know, I'm laying there and wake up and there, you know, I got a visitor and it's the boss. He's, he's sitting there, you know, he's, he's just like unannounced, you know, just came and, and just wanted to let me know that he was thinking about me and, that the team was thinking about me and, and he was like, you know, they're going to win it. They're going to win it all. I was like, I know they are. Cause I mean, I knew what a great team that was. That was such a powerful team all around in every aspect of the game. This team was so great from the pitching to our defense, to clutch hitting and, and getting it done and, and just having so much fun. We had so much fun at that time. And I think that's what, what felt so good. I mean, I remember hitting two pinch hit grand slams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in one year, I hit one in um, Kansas City, and I hit one in Oakland. You know, so it was it was just a it was just a phenomenal team, and and a, and a joy to be around and have such good friends.